like all the sessions, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat group or raise your hand and we'll try and make it as informal as possible. I gave Alan a bit of a, a heads up that um, he should expect questions and, uh, and feel free to ask questions. I think the whole point of these is not just to run through a bunch of slides and then go, right, we told you so. It's for everyone to try and learn as much as possible, including ourselves. Um, I certainly learn a lot from Alan and uh, some of the information he's presenting today is very interesting and raises a lot of questions uh, in my head um, about what is current practice and what we should be looking for in the future as well. So um, we'll get into it. Um, let me just, why is that not going? Oh, that, sorry. Okay, so thank you everyone for attending today. Um, I know I'm just gonna say, my name's Scott Tyndall, co-founder of Fuel In. Uh, yeah, really excited to have Alan on board. Uh, I will introduce Elizabeth and then we'll let Alan take over. You're on mute, Elizabeth. Of course I am. Uh, <laughs> the other performance nutrition coach here at Fuelin. Um, obviously hydration, you guys have all heard me talk about it. Big, big passion of mine that is, and women's sport especially. Um, I'm anxious and excited, big fan of this group uh so ready to ready to dive in perfect and uh just as a as a, a warm welcome thank you to alan uh dr alan mccubbin for coming on today's q a for everyone um alan i will let him uh talk about his bio but just uh he, he's a great guy a wealth of knowledge, um, a registered Australian sports dietitian, researcher and lecturer at Monash Uni. And Alan, please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I've, as you said, um, I've been a sports dietitian for ooh, coming up to 20 years now, which is a bit scary, <laughs> making me feel my <laughs> age. Um, and, and started out working primarily as a practitioner for, for many, many years. Uh, did a lot of work, particularly in endurance and ultra endurance sports, uh, I guess, the big one here was when so i'm based in melbourne so down in in the southern part of australia uh, and i guess the big thing here was we didn't have our own sort of standalone iron man event until 2011 i think it was or 2012 i'm trying to remember now uh, when the asia pacific championships for iron man came to melbourne for the first time and that was you know we had a lot of people that were going interstate for iron mans and you know you'd work with those athletes but it just as a sport here in melbourne just exploded around that time and i think i spent three months it was in march i spent the first three months of every year for the next three years just writing race plans for people <laughs> non-stop um sort of got sick of writing race plans after a little while um but what was interesting i think during that time was that you know, I was doing a lot of work of, of writing these race plans and trying to say, okay, well, you know, people are with looking at the carbohydrate that they're having, you know, how much per hour um, and where they're getting that from, how much fluid per hour versus how much fluid they're going to need. And I had this spreadsheet set up, um, I guess, probably similar to, to what you guys are doing with, with fueling, but, you know, obviously a, a crude one decade ago version of that. Um, and worry, you know, I had the... I was on... I was on Google Sheets for a long time. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I had the, the carbohydrate content of the different products in there. I had the, obviously, the fluid content that I was working with. And then I had the sodium content. And so I was calculating these three things and I'd sort of hit targets around carbohydrate and around fluid. And then I get to this sodium bit and I had all the data there, but I was kind of like, well, what do I do with this data? And so that kind of led into my academic career, which kicked off in sort of about 2015 where uh, I had an opportunity to go back and teach at Monash University here in Melbourne and do a PhD at the same time. Uh, and normally with a PhD, there's sort of a, a project that's already up and running and there's funding and you come in to do the project. Um, but I was in a unique position that they needed someone to come in and teach in the sports nutrition area and it was really open-ended. So I walked in and they said, well, what do you want to do a PhD on? Which is unusual. That doesn't normally happen, but it was a really great opportunity for me. So I sort of thought back a few years to all those Ironman plans that I'd written and said, well, you know, sodium what do we know about it not a lot um you know we we work out all these sodium numbers but what do they mean and you know sweat testing had been around for for 10 years in terms of working out the sodium content in people's sweat 
but you know what do we do with that there were literally no guidelines on what to take that testing data and what do you actually do with it so that's where i decided to sort of put my effort given that there was this massive gap there in our knowledge and obviously when there's a gap in scientific knowledge something's going to come in and fill that gap and that could be literally anything so yeah so that's been the last sort of six or seven years for me i did a PhD over three and a bit years looking at different aspects of sodium, looking at whether your sweat sodium concentration changes due to changes in your diet, because a lot of athletes will change the amount of sodium that they're eating either deliberately or just because they're carb loading in the days before a race. And because of that, they change the types of foods, the amount of food, and therefore the amount of sodium they're getting. So we wanted to understand, well, does that actually change then your sweat sodium concentration on race day compared to when you tested it two or three months ago in training on your, your usual day-to-day -day diet? So did that, sort of finished that, and then been doing other bits of work in this sort of sodium space ever since that, uh, including some modeling data, which is starting to give us a bit more insight into, okay, well, you get a sweat sodium result what does that actually mean what what should we do about that uh, how much should we actually replace how much do we need to replace and i guess that's what we're going to talk about today awesome uh very excited so just as a very brief overview we're going to cover sweat and sodium and alan's going to talk us through uh what what is sweat and what is sodium and their purpose we're going to talk about this testing procedures and talk about the difference as uh, a sweat sodium concentration test versus a sweat rate test, discuss electrolytes, whether they're required or not based on research and also uh, field and sort of some practical recommendations. And as we said, we'll, we'll hopefully have time for Q&A. I know we've got an hour for this session, um, but feel free to put questions in the, in the chat group and we'll try and get to those as we go. Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. All right, so I guess the, the first place to start with all of this is to think about, well, what does sodium actually do in the body? Why is that important? And if we lose sodium through sweat, is that a problem? And if so, you know, how much should we replace? Why are we replacing that? What's the purpose of it? What are we trying to achieve from all of that? So it's really going back to those kind of fundamental principles of, of all of this um, and, and coming in with kind of no assumptions. So the kind of benefits, if you go and ask people, uh, and during my PhD, we actually surveyed about 400 endurance and ultra endurance athletes from about 17 countries and asked them, you know, do you think sodium is important? And if so, why do you think it's important? Uh, and so people said things like performance, uh, preventing hyponatremia, preventing cramping, which is obviously a big one. And, and we'll probably get into that a, a little bit later on. Uh, the blood volume one I'll come back to. Uh, because that's some of that recent work I think is is in that space. Um, some of the other benefits that are kind of proposed, and these are probably things that are more proposed by the sports drink industry, I guess, as potential benefits of um, you know, adding sodium to products or having a particular amount of sodium in products, saying that this product is better because kind of thing. Um, some of it can be around encouraging fluid intake, so actually making you want to drink more, and we'll we'll come back to that. Um, increasing fluid absorption from the gut. So obviously all this fluid goes into our stomach and then our small intestine, and then we've got to get it out of there and into our bloodstream. Uh, and then just around taste preferences, you know, add salt to things and it'll taste better. Um, as opposed to having, if you imagine a sports drink, you took all the salt out of it, it would just kind of taste like cordial or soda. Um, it'd probably be very sweet and you wouldn't want to drink it that much. So then you start to go through and have a look at, okay, well, what's the scientific evidence for all of these seven things that you can see on the screen there? Performance, I think, is a really interesting one. Um, most people kind of assume that sodium is important from a performance point of view, but the question is, well, what is it about sodium that improves performance? Obviously, carbohydrate, we know it's a fuel source and we use that uh, during exercise. We know if we lose a certain amount of water, in terms of dehydration, that's going to impact performance because our blood volume shrinks and that's problematic. But sodium is a much harder one to kind of pin down and say, well, why does it or would it impact on performance? And again, during my PhD, we did a, a systematic review, which is basically where you scour 
the scientific literature and try and find every paper that's ever been published on a particular thing. Uh, and in this case, we looked at sodium replacement during exercise and endurance performance. Uh, and to my surprise, well, probably not really a, a huge surprise because no one was really talking about it, but I could only find five papers ever published that met the criteria that we'd set for this review and um, of the, oh, sorry, six papers. And of those, some of them had some major issues from a scientific perspective. So that was problematic. Uh, none of them had been done in hot weather. So that was problematic. And none of them, and to this day, not a single um, research study has been published where they actually personalized the sodium that they gave the participants in the study. So they've all just given them the same amount. And for some people, that's probably more than they need. In some people, it's probably nowhere near enough. Um, and so I'm actually just finished up a study now, which as far as I'm aware is the first one ever, where we actually sweat tested people beforehand and we're actually personalizing the, the sodium that we're giving them as part of the study. Um, but what we found was that from those studies, um, we could only find one that had ever suggested a performance benefit from sodium. All the others suggested no benefit. But as I said, there's some issues with, with pretty much all of those studies. So uh, I think that's one that still needs a, a bit more work. The hyponatremia one is an interesting space. Kind of everyone assumes, well, hypo means low, nat means sodium, and emia means blood, so low blood sodium. So if that's low, then surely more sodium must prevent that. Uh, and yes, it can to an extent, but remembering it's low blood sodium as a concentration, so it's relative to water. So not only will sodium affect blood sodium concentration, but the amount of water will affect it as well. Uh, and I'll show you some data shortly that just shows mathematically the water has a far greater influence than the sodium. Yes, the sodium has an influence, but the water has a much greater influence. So if you over drinking fluid, it doesn't matter how much sodium you put in unless you you know, taking huge amounts of tablets or something, um, you, you're going to end up with hyponatremia anyway. Uh, the blood volume one is kind of related to that. And, and this is where I think there may be a, a benefit from sodium, uh, but also possibly while we're not seeing that in those current performance studies is that I think you have to look at um, a very large water turnover. And we'll come back to that shortly in terms of what that means um, to actually see an effect of sodium on maintaining a better blood volume. And um, and then that might lead to to better performance outcomes, but it's probably going to be in sort of events of Ironman distance or above, sort of your ultra marathon type stuff, or your you know twenty four hour mountain biking and and that kind of thing, where you're going to see most of those benefits. Uh, cramping we'll come back to a little bit later. Um, there's some interesting insights around that, um, which we can talk about shortly. Uh, and then encouraging fluid intake. A lot of that information or, or scientific data was around sort of post-exercise and you know, adding sodium to drinks makes you drink more after exercise but there is now a bit more data that suggests it also does help during exercise so I think that's a potential positive for people who are struggling to get in enough fluid if this encourages you to drink more then that's possibly a good thing but if you're someone who tends to over drink then maybe it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, fluid absorption, there's been some really good research in this space, mainly led by the sports drink industry, but ironically, most of that has shown that the sodium has a very small and almost trivial impact on fluid absorption from the gut during exercise. And in fact, carbohydrate probably has a greater influence than the sodium does. So it's probably not something we need to, to think about or, or worry too much about. And then taste preference, as I said before, becomes really important, and particularly the longer the event becomes as a general rule, the more we tend to turn away from sweet tasting foods and towards more savory tasting foods. And obviously salt is going to provide that, that flavor profile. So that can be a beneficial effect there as well. Cool. Perfect. So if we need to understand, I guess, this relationship between salt or sodium and water in the body, I think that's a really good place to start because it's it's really important that we understand that because then that leads to, okay, well, what impact is replacing water or replacing sodium or replacing both going to have during exercise? So this diagram here is actually a sweat gland, that funny pink uh, colored thing. So you can see there's kind of a, a squiggly part at the bottom that's called the secretory duct. And that's where the sweat is initially made. So this is obviously within a few layers of skin. And then you've got the straight bit that comes up, which is called the straight duct. Um, and then at the top is where the sweat 
comes out onto the skin surface and then obviously evaporates off to cool us down, which is why we produce sweat during exercise. But if we have a look at the different electrolytes that are in sweat, how they get in there, how much gets in there, and then what happens to it, uh, this is where it starts to um, get a bit scientific, but also important. So down the bottom there, we've got the various different electrolytes. So Na is sodium. So these are just the chemical symbols for them. Cl minus is chloride. K plus is potassium. Ca2 plus is calcium. And Mg2 plus is magnesium. And you can see the concentrations of those on the right there. And what we find is that the secretory duct of the sweat gland sits in what we call the interstitial fluid. It's basically the fluid that sits outside of our cells uh, and it exchanges electrolytes pretty readily with our blood. So what you see is that the concentration of these electrolytes around the base of the sweat gland is basically the same as what it is in our blood when we take a blood sample. And we know that once that goes into the sweat gland, it's pretty much in that same concentration. So the initial sweat our body makes is pretty much the same concentration of all those electrolytes as the blood. But what happens as the sweat moves up that straight part is what I've done with that little inset there is you get what's called reabsorption of the sodium and the chloride. So some of that sodium and chloride goes out of the sweat gland and back into the body instead of going out onto the skin surface. Um, and that is regulated. It can change for various factors the diet, as I mentioned in my PhD, we showed that if you change the amount of salt in your diet, you'll actually change the amount of salt in your sweat. And this is the reason why. Um, you can also have uh, people with genetic um, mutations. So people with cystic fibrosis, for example, um, have a mutation in the gene that encodes for this reabsorption. And so they don't reabsorb that sodium. And so they have extremely high sweat sodium concentrations that come out onto the skin surface and that's a problem for them. Um, but for the rest of us, not so much an issue. So what you generally see is because some of the sodium and chloride is recaptured by the body, but the water isn't, and the magnesium, the calcium and potassium aren't either, is that we end up with a sodium concentration in the sweat that ends up on our skin surface that's significantly lower than what it is in the bloodstream. So in the blood, about 135 to 145 millimoles per litre, but our actual sweat sodium concentration is typically about 20 to 80 millimoles per litre, and the average is around 40-ish. Now, you can see values higher than this if you go out and stick a patch on your skin and, and take do a sweat test that way. But a patch on any individual site doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening over the entire body. And we know from studies where they've compared those two methods that generally the whole body values you get are much lower than what you get at individual patch sites that we commonly use. Uh, and so 80 millimoles per litre doesn't sound like that much compared to some of the patches where you can see up to 100. But if you look over the whole body, uh, a, a value of 80 is very, extremely high. It's very rare to see that. I think the highest I've ever seen is probably low 70s. Um, as I said, the, the exception to that would be someone with cystic fibrosis. But uh, obviously that's a, a very select group of people. So I guess the bottom line from all of this is that as we sweat, we're losing water and we're losing sodium, but we're losing proportionally more water than what we're losing sodium. And that becomes important in what terms of what's happening in the blood or, or the water that's remaining in the body. The final thing I'll just say before we move on here, if you look at the concentrations of potassium, calcium and magnesium here, they're actually really, really low. And that's because the concentration of those electrolytes in our blood is really, really low. So even though we don't conserve any of that, it doesn't really matter because it's such a minuscule amount um, that it really adds up to, to not very much. And that just reflects the fact that those minerals have other roles in the body and exist in different parts of the body. So the potassium uh, and, and to some extent, the magnesium mainly sits inside our cells rather than in the fluid outside our cells. Uh, and the calcium obviously mainly sits in our bones, um, obviously little bits and pieces in other areas of the body, but that's where the majority of our calcium kind of resides. Okay. Do you want to move Alan, I've got two questions. To the next one. Two questions for you, Alan. Um, the significance of the low concentration of potassium and calcium magnesium is the significance of that, therefore, that any electrolyte that you would potentially consume would not require any of those minerals in it. Is that what you're saying? Oh, so I missed the start of that, but I think you were saying, is there no point to replacing those Correct. because you lose them in such small quantities? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the scientific consensus. Obviously, there's a lot of products out there that really emphasize the potassium, calcium, magnesium and use those as a kind of point of difference or a selling point from a marketing perspective. But really, we're not seeing any scientific evidence that uh, we're losing those in quantities enough that cause any kind of issue or that replacing them is going to be of any particular benefit. I mean, the amount of magnesium, for example, that you lose in sweat during exercise, even if it's a really long session, you know, you'll eat that back within 24 hours of just your normal diet without doing anything out of the ordinary. Yeah, like a, a single banana would easily replace that. And and, and the uh, taking in extra magnesium wouldn't, in my understanding, it wouldn't have any performance benefits or physiological benefits. Is that, not is that, that we know of. I mean, a lot of people really swear by magnesium supplements and there has been a bit of work with British athletics actually looking at whether athletes are likely to be magnesium deficient or not. Uh, but whether they are or not doesn't seem to be due to sweat losses. If it is, yeah. it's for some other reason. Um, and so it's not necessarily that you have to replace it during exercise. It's more that the amount of magnesium that an athlete needs day to day, week to week, month to month might be greater but again it's very early days in that research so i don't think we can be too definitive or confident around that just and yet. i think and that's a distinction isn't it we're talking about sweat here and replacing potentially during the, exercise yeah during exercise versus habitually and maybe the need for replacing magnesium due to deficiencies external to exercise correct right? yeah okay so that that's yep. good and then you mentioned about um Obviously, my understanding is there is differing concentrations of sweat glands in different parts of the body. Mm. Would that, and in relation to where that sweat patch put, say the forehead has a high concentration of sweat glands, mm. is that going to impact the sweat reading that is being yep. provided by these? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It does. Uh, and that's why you have to be really careful when you do testing. If you get a result back, which is just the result of a patch, and it hasn't been, there's mathematical formulas that attempt to estimate the whole body loss based on the result at certain patch sites where they have been compared to the whole body. So if you stick it on a standardized site where there is that equation, you can make that conversion. But if you just stick it on anywhere, um, then you, you're pretty much guessing. Okay. And, yep. and, and generally speaking, <clears throat> the, the ones that we have used in the past have all been pretty much higher than the whole body values that we would expect to see. Okay. And just so, and just for clarification, uh, the calculation from millimoles per litre to milligrams is what, how would you yep. time? How would you so, yeah, so it's, it's based on what we call the molecular mass. So it's different for each mineral. For sodium, it's 23. So basically so you take a millimole mass. value for sodium, multiply it by 23 and you'll get milligrams. Uh, for potassium, it's 39. For calcium, it's 40. For magnesium, I think it's 20 off the top of my head. Okay, yep. perfect. And do you know, like, uh, for instance, some of the testing measures, do they take into consideration the location of where the sweat test for this concentration is being taken from, like from the forearm or from the forehead or from the upper mm. arm? Uh, is that standardised and is that included in their calculation? Uh, it would depend on the company. You'd have to check. I know some of them do. Um, and they're very aware that that is an issue and, and also aware that it hasn't been done well in the past as well. Um, some companies, I don't think necessarily do that. They just give you the value at the patch and assume that that's, you know, um, equivalent to a whole body value. Um, but, you know, I've worked or, or had, you know, athletes that have been tested through a few companies where they get a result back and it has been converted to an estimated whole body sweat sodium concentration. So they've they've done that properly and used the correct equation for, as you said, the particular site that the patch is put on because there's different equations for different sites. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. So as I said before, because we retain some of this sodium and chloride back into the body, we're losing proportionally more water than we're losing sodium during exercise. What that basically means is if we go out and exercise and we don't drink any fluid at all and don't take in any sodium at all and we start to become dehydrated over time, by definition, our blood sodium concentration is going to go up. So even though we're losing sodium, we're losing proportionally more water than we're losing sodium. And so the 
the concentration or the balance between the two shifts in favour of more sodium for every litre of water in the blood. And so our blood sodium concentration is going to go up. So what this graph is looking at is saying, okay, well, what if we do start drinking water? And possibly, you know, we have different sweat sodium concentrations. So if we go from sort of left to right across the graph here, you'll see down the bottom, I've got fluid replacement in percentage terms. So in other words, if you sweated at one litre an hour and you replaced half of that, so 500 mils an hour is what you drank, then you're replacing 50%. If you drank 600 mils an hour, you'd be replacing 60% and, and so on. And so obviously, as I said, if you drank zero, your blood sodium concentration would go up no matter how salty or not salty your sweat sodium concentration is. Um, obviously, it would go up more if, you salt, uh, if your sweat was less salty, and, but it would still go up a little bit if it was even if it was very salty because it's still going to even the saltier sweaters, their sweat is still less salty than their blood. But as you start to drink more and more water, what you're going to see is you, you hit this tipping point where uh, now you're replacing water, you're not replacing sodium, you're going to get to the point eventually where you do drop the blood sodium concentration. And obviously the extreme example of this is where you drink too much water, so more than 100% of your sweat losses and you end up with hyponatremia. But what you can see in this graph here is that that sort of happens progressively. It's not like it goes up and then all of a sudden it just goes down. It, it happens sort of in stages. So the, the tipping point seems to be around that kind of 70% replacement. So once you, your rate of drinking is more than about 70% of your sweat rate, then you're going to tend to see your blood sodium concentration start to fall. And obviously the saltier you sweat, the, the sooner that will occur. Uh, and you can see there you've got 20, 40, 60 and 80 millimoles per litre in terms of that sweat sodium concentration and obviously the saltier your sweat, the earlier and the more pronounced that that drop um, will occur. But 70% seems to be for, for most people probably that kind of tipping point. And so I guess then we start to ask the question, well, in what situations would people actually drink more than 70% of their sweat losses? And we'll get to some sort of practical suggestions or, or rules of thumb around that uh, in a few slides time. Uh, but I think that's kind of the, the key point here is that unless you're drinking more than 70% of your sweat losses, your blood sodium concentration will actually go up, not down. And so, Alan, when if, if an athlete is looking at this graph, and I'm sure a lot of them are trying to get their head around it, if, if they are consciously aware of they have a high sweat rate, and they're trying to maintain some level of percentage of body weight loss, i.e. trying to keep it maybe around 2 to 3% body weight loss. They're trying to consume somewhere between 60 and 70% of their fluids in order to practice for race day. Is this therefore saying if they are replacing 60 to 70%, there would be potentially a need to replace some sodium in those fluids? Yes, and that's what we'll get to in a couple of slides time. And that's the sort of that modeling work that I've done just okay. recently. Yeah, yeah. But below that, no. And and again, we'll, we'll talk a bit later on about some rules of thumb in terms of what scenarios actually require replacing more than 70% of your fluid losses because it's actually less common than people would typically think. Yeah, cool. Uh, again, this slide is, is a little bit messy, but um, what this basically describes is you know, again, getting towards, well, when do you actually need to replace a large percentage of your sweat losses in terms of how much you drink back during exercise? And, and what we see here is that the longer the event, the higher that percentage of, of sweat loss uh, needs to be replaced. And just to, to walk you through it, uh, if we start off just ignoring everything except for that green line that goes up. So this is uh, just an, one example. We could put in dozens of different examples here, but the pattern would be the same. We've got a 70 kilo athlete here with a fluid loss of a thousand mils, so a litre per hour. And if they were to drink a litre per hour as they were losing a litre per hour, the amount of fluid that they drank would follow that green line. So at one hour, they've drunk a litre. At two hours, they've drunk two litres. At three hours, they've drunk three litres and so forth. And that's that green line there. Now, if they drink more than that, so the bench, basically the, the amount they're going to drink is above that green line, then you're into that dark blue shaded area where you're overhydrated. And there's not a single person that ever recommends that anyone does that. There's no benefit to doing it. And obviously the risk is hyponatremia. So we don't want to go you know, above that. 
but at the same time we don't want to be significantly dehydrated either and so the red dashed line now represents a two percent body mass deficit in terms of water loss now you can there's a lot of arguments and the two percent mark is still quite controversial and you could make an argument that it should be three percent or four percent or some people might even say one percent it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this diagram where that red dashed line is whether it's at three percent two percent one percent the fact is it's going to follow that kind of pattern so the, the idea here is if you want to finish your race or your training session with less than a two percent body mass loss you've got to be somewhere between the red dashed line and the green line in that light blue band and so how much do you actually need to drink to finish within that light blue band and that's where those blue lines come in so down the bottom the dark blue one if you only drank back 25 percent of your sweat losses you can see you're going to fall out of that band at around the two hour mark in other words you could only you could get away with replacing only 25 percent of your sweat losses in terms of fluid for about two hours uh, and still stay within that kind of well hydrated band so to speak but if you then go out to three hours you can see you're now going to need to replace about 50 percent of your sweat losses and then if you go out to six hours of exercise you now need to go up to 75 percent um, sweat replacement so it's just the the mass of it all so basically what it's showing us is that the longer the event goes the the greater percentage of our sweat losses fluid wise we need to replace to stay within sort of an absolute level of, of hydration um, and so yeah once you start to get out to Ironman and Ultraman and things obviously that percentage goes up and up and up but bearing in mind obviously the pace is lower so the sweat rate is likely to be lower as well so it might be a higher percentage but it's a higher percentage of a lower sweat rate so it might not be a thousand mils an hour anymore it might be 800 mils an hour or 600 mils an hour and obviously on a cold day compared to a hot day that kind of thing but it gives us some insight into when we're likely to get to that kind of 70 percent fluid replacement being actually required yeah and I, I mean i guess for you know a lot of age group athletes even a 70.3 distance is going to extend into that five to six hour as well which yep. you know and if you're looking at that graph you know somewhere if they're only replacing 50%, they're certainly going to start to get into that three to 4% dehydration. And it looks like, you know, that five, you know, that four and a half to five hour period start, starts to become critical. Is that what I'm reading from that? Like in terms of yeah, maintaining yeah, and, some sort of body mass deficit. Yeah. And it becomes a bit of a balancing act too, because like sure. it's, it's well and good for us to say, oh, we need 80% fluid replacement. But if you're sweating at two liters an hour, you know, 80% of two liters an hour is almost impossible to drink. You just, sure. one, accessing that much fluid and two, being able to tolerate and have your stomach empty, that volume of fluid is almost impossible anyway. So, mm. that, yeah, there's kind of an upper limit. And, and again, when we come to the rules of thumb at the end, you know, the higher the sweat rate, the less likely that is to be actually practical. And actually, as we see from the relationship between water and sodium, it then actually means you don't need as much sodium or to as aggressively replace the sodium. Mm -hmm. okay so this comes to that mathematical modeling i was talking about uh, that i published earlier this year so this is based on an equation that was put together originally by some um, kidney physicians at ucla uh, for use in intensive care units and things like that but it has been validated uh, for use during exercise as well so it doesn't matter whether the the fluid and the sodium going in is intravenous as it would be in a in a hospital bed in an intensive care unit like that or whether it's being drunk during exercise and then the losses are through sweat rather than urine the basic principles seem to hold so basically what you see here again we've got along the bottom the proportion of the fluid that we replace so again if we're losing a liter an hour 50 percent here is drinking 500 mils an hour 80 percent is drinking 800 mils an hour and so forth what you see here is two phenomenon firstly obviously as we replace that fluid more aggressively our need for sodium goes up so the bars here represent the proportion of your sodium loss now that you need to replace to maintain a stable blood sodium from the start to finish of exercise so as you can see once you get up to sort of 90 percent fluid replacement you need quite a bit of sodium 
But the question is, how often do you actually need to or can physically replace 90% of your fluid losses? It's not very often. There's not many circumstances where that would happen. Probably more your sort of ultra marathon or enduro man type things where you're going sort of 15 hours plus, I would say, might fall into that category. Iron Man, I'm thinking probably around that 70 to 80% mark and 70.3, probably more around that sort of 50 to 70% mark, somewhere like that. And obviously the different bars represent the different sweat sodium concentrations. So if you're a very salty sweater, you might be the orange or the red bar. If you're not a very salty sweater, you're probably the blue or the green bar. So you can see there, until you really aggressively replace fluid, um, you really don't need sodium um, to maintain a, you know, to consume sodium to maintain a, a stable blood sodium concentration if you have an average so 40 millimoles the green one there is about the average for most people if you look at a you know data over hundreds or thousands of people that have done sweat sodium tests most people sit around that 40 mark 60 is quite high that orange bars and 80 as i said i've never seen anyone actually hit 80 before um, i've heard a couple of people that have come across it but i've never actually seen it myself so, Alan, if, if looking at the 70% of proportion of sweat fluid losses replaced, you're saying that they would need to replace, if they were in the 60 millimole, they would need to replace 26% of that loss? Is that of what their you're sodium saying? losses. Of yep. their sodium losses. Yep. So 26% of the, let's times that uh, by 20, what was it, 23? So what are you saying they replaced 26 percent of say a thousand milligrams is that what you're saying yeah so roughly 260 60 milligrams, milligrams an hour yeah per yeah, hour exactly. or per liter uh well it depends on how you measure it okay um yeah which we'll, we'll and, get to later okay. i mean i don't yeah. i think for, for this purpose as long as you're measuring everything it probably doesn't matter which way you look at it mm -hmm. um i guess the per liter would take into account the fact that maybe the amount you drink is going to vary from hour to hour, um, yeah. maybe more than you expect or less than you expect. And this becomes a, a bit of a chicken and egg question as well in terms of do you plan to drink a certain amount of fluid and then match the sodium to that? Or do you have a certain amount of sodium and then assume that that's going to drive the thirst to make you drink up to a certain amount? Um, and no one's ever looked at that, so we don't really have good answers. Um, that's probably a more a philosophical question yeah. than a scientific one at this stage, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, so this kind of puts all of that together and, and tries to um, give some real world context to this and some, some rules of thumb that you can kind of go by. And I guess that the purpose of that modeling that I did was really to try and identify in what situations is actually going out and doing a sweat test for sodium concentration important. And in what situations does it really not matter? So we go back and, and I think we will in just a sec to all of those different reasons why you might want to take sodium during exercise. Some of them were more around just improving the flavor of what you're drinking. And so you're more likely to drink more of it. And so I kind of call that season to taste because it's got nothing to do with a sweat test. You don't need a sweat test to tell you how much sodium to put in a drink to make it taste right for you. Um, whereas trying to balance the water intake to get the blood sodium concentration right depends on how much you're losing. And that's where doing that sweat sodium test might actually add some value. So the key question here is in what situations is going out and doing a test going to add value? And in what cases is it not adding any value and we don't need to worry about it? So we start at the top of this kind of tree here. Um, exercise durations of less than four hours. There's really never a situation where you need to replace more than about 70% of your fluid losses if your exercise is less than four hours. Or if you have extremely high sweat rates, I'm thinking like elite marathon runners, for example, or maybe pro Olympic distance triathletes, something like that on a really hot day, you might have a sweat rate of two or two and a half liters an hour. But again, it's never going to be possible to actually access and tolerate consuming more than 70% of two or two and a half liters an hour anyway. So even if theoretically you would benefit from that, you practically, you're not going to be able to do it anyway. So in that case, you're not going to get to the point where you need a targeted sodium. So season to taste, basically. So then you work your way down. Okay, your event is more than four hours. So obviously for all your long course triathlon events, that's going to be the case. Um, and then again, looking at that sweat rate, if you're sweating more than 1800 mils an hour, you know, drinking more than 12 or 1300 mils an hour for the vast majority of people is going to be 
practically impossible. Either you can't access the fluid or you can't tolerate it. And so in that case, again, uh, targeting a specific amount of sodium in your drinks doesn't matter because your blood sodium concentration is going to go up regardless. And so then you come down again and say, okay, well, my sweat rate is less than 1800 mils an hour. Are we going to replace uh, or can we replace more than 70% of our sweat fluid losses? If the answer is no, either because we can't, we don't want to, it's not practical or whatever, um, then again, you know, there's no point. Your blood sodium concentration is going to go up. So trying to quantify your sodium loss to, to stop it going down is irrelevant. Um, so it's only really when you then get to someone who is exercising for more than four hours, their sweat rate's less than about 1,800 mils an hour, and they can and will drink more than 70% of their fluid losses back again. In that case, then yes, that's when sweat sodium testing might be useful. And for a lot of long course and ultra endurance type events, they will fall into this category. Um, so that that's perfectly reasonable. And so I think the conclusion from all of this work, because we did modeling in sort of team sports, so soccer games, we did elite marathon running, and then we did an ultra marathon. And the conclusion from all of that was that the ultra distance stuff, yes, sweat sodium testing might actually add value, but for a lot of the team sports and the shorter endurance type events, sort of under four hours or even up to maybe five, but with a really high sweat rate, there, there just really doesn't seem to be any point to doing that. The final thing I'd say before we move on to the next slide, Scott, is that all of this is around balancing the, the water that you're replacing with the sodium. So the two are kind of staying in balance in the blood. A lot of people kind of say, oh, yeah, but I've got a really high sweat rate. And so I'm losing, you know, 1500 milligrams or 2000 milligrams an hour of sodium, I'm going to be in a deficit. So I need to replace that regardless. Well, it's actually still a pretty small amount compared to the total sodium in your body. Um, and we can't find any scientific mechanism explanation or evidence that a sodium deficit is actually causing any problem. The problems seem to be the, the mismatch between water and sodium in the body. And so it's it's about matching the sodium up to the water turnover, the, the losses versus replacement, as opposed to saying just in, completely independently of water, I'm losing this much sodium, therefore I need to replace it. We can't see any scientific reason that that, that would be important other than to balance these water changes. Uh, uh, Elliot, does that answer your question? Because what Alan, what uh, Elliot was asking was, you've got on the bottom replace sort of, you know, an up upper value of sixty five percent of sodium losses. Are you saying there that you're not seeing any need to replace higher than sixty five percent of that loss? That there, there's been no research on that to date. Is that correct? That yeah. If you go back, I think it was just one slide actually. If you go back one slide. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, this one. So I guess if you look at which bars there sort of exceed 65%, it's only really once you're starting to replace more than 90% of your fluid losses mm -hmm. that you're then going to drop your blood sodium if you don't replace more than 65% of your sodium losses. Um, but replacing 90% or more of your fluid losses is quite unusual. Um, it's unnecessary in the vast majority of situations um, and it's not practical in the, in the majority of situations although there is people obviously that do over drink and tend to get hyponatremia um, but that's probably more an education piece about not over drinking as opposed to you actually needed to drink that amount right. and that um, fits that fits really well though I guess with what we tend to say is like we never encourage people to drink 100% of sweat rate of fluid losses yeah. and we also have certainly had that narrative with whatever the testing value is, if they're told they're losing a thousand milligrams per liter or a thousand milligrams per hour, we would generally recommend somewhere in that 40 to 60% replacement, at least to start. And mm -hmm. would you sort of subscribe to that? Is that what you're sort of saying? Cause like I see some of these values coming out of some of these sodium testing things and i'm like well that's just not feasible to take in that amount of sodium and is it required so is that yeah. what you're saying like start with a yeah. percent of that value yeah and i guess the other way to look at it is what's going to happen if you over replace the sodium so if you don't need more than 65 percent, but you go out and replace 95 percent, for example what's what's the consequence of that or what's going to happen well, the main thing that's going to happen is it's going to push your blood sodium concentration even higher 
Yeah. And that's going to do a couple of things. One is it's going to force fluid to move out of your cells and into the blood to try and balance out the uh, what we call the osmolality um, between the, the fluid that's inside our cells and the fluid that's outside our cells. So our, sh our cell volume will actually shrink. Now, whether that's a problem or not, we don't really know. Um, probably not a major problem. We're not seeing that. Uh, but the other thing that it will do by having really salty blood is it makes you incredibly thirsty. Um, so obviously that's trying to get the water in to balance that and bring it all back into balance. So we've kind of overdone the sodium and now our body's saying now we need to get more water in to correct that overdoing the sodium, if that makes sense. But yeah. I guess the downside to that is if you're out in the middle of a, a bike leg and you're between aid stations and you haven't got enough fluid to satisfy that thirst, it's not a very good feeling psychologically. Uh, you get the old desert now. <laughs> yes, exactly right. Feel terrible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and so this final one is really just trying to take that and make it even more simple or as simple as we can. And basically just coming back to the, okay, we can do a sweat rate test, know what our losses are likely to be. And I know, Scott, we're going to talk about sort of the nuances of that shortly. Um, and then look at what's realistic to drink and how much we actually need to drink. And if the answer is it's less than 70% of our sweat losses, then our blood sodium is almost always going to go up. And so really taking a, a targeted amount of sodium is not adding value here because it, you know, whatever sodium we're putting is just going to make it go up even more. So in that case, we can really think about sodium as something that's there for taste purposes rather than a specific balancing out the water purpose because we don't need to, to do that already. Then if we shift to the middle there, so our fluid intake is around kind of 70 to 80% of our, our sweat losses. And this is probably relevant for, for Ironman particularly, and maybe 70.3 in really hot weather. Um, in these cases, our blood sodium is only going to fall if we have above average sweat sodium concentrations, which is above about 40 millimoles per liter as a whole body level, not the individual patch values. So if that's the case, then you're kind of talking about that 30 to 65% replacement um, but if your sweat sodium is below average, then probably, again, it's more about the taste um, and, and just you know, enjoying or being more likely to want to eat and drink the, the foods and fluids you've got out there with you. And then the final one is if you're drinking more than 90% of your fluid losses, well, there's very, very few situations where we would actually recommend doing that or it's actually necessary. Uh, Ultraman might be the exception in from a triathlon perspective, or it's going to be sort of ultra trail runs and things like that, that you might get somewhere close to that. Um, and in these situations, doesn't matter what, uh, you know, how salty or not salty your sweat is, that volume of water that you've replaced is going to drop your blood sodium and therefore replacing sodium will be helpful to balance that out. And so if you've got above average sweat sodium, then you're then talking sort of 70 to 85% of your sodium losses being replaced. But for most people, it's more likely to be around the 30 to 40, maybe 50%, something like that um, kind of values that you see. So I guess the key thing here is that there's really no situation that we can foresee where replacing 100% of your sodium losses is of any value or is going to be beneficial. Um, and I guess that comes back to the, you know, where I started with the whole sweat sodium testing, we get these values and what do we do with them? Well, the first mm. thing is we don't take 100% of that and try and replace it during exercise because all it's going to do is push our blood sodium up and make us excessively thirsty. No, that makes complete sense. In terms of that, um, you know, you're saying when the sweat sodium concentration is greater than 40 millimoles, I guess the issue is, is, is the value that's being reported via all this testing, is it accurate? Well, yeah. We'll because how do we work shortly. out yeah how do we work out if the testing number because we're, we're i mean typically i am seeing very high numbers like mm -hmm. i would say majority i would probably say 70 to 80 percent of athletes that are getting tested are well over 40 millimoles yep. um, as a value and but you're saying that value depending on the site and the calculation might not be as accurate as one would hope yeah saying? so if you i mean the most common site that's used for patch testing is a forearm um yep. probably i reckon 90 percent of tests that go on is a forearm patch and yes you're right you'll see values of somewhere between probably 50 and 100 millimoles per liter at that site yep. but once you apply the correction equation to estimate whole body sweat sodium concentration 
it'll bring it down to probably 30 to 50 millimoles per litre, generally speaking. So yeah, if people are just reporting the value back from that individual patch, then that's a problem because they're not converting it to the whole body loss. So should athletes be asking these companies if they are doing the conversion yep. to whole body? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good question. I, I've never actually asked them if they do that conversion, so I, I certainly mm. will. Mm. And I know a couple of companies here in Australia that definitely do because I've spoken to them, but uh, I suspect a lot don't. Can you name who those companies would be? Uh, so there's one called SOS, which is actually a UK company, but they set up a subsidiary here in Australia. I know they... Yeah, we know uh, SOS the, well. We know James yeah. well. Yeah, so the guy who originally set that up, Andy, uh, I knew quite well from before he worked for them. And because I was starting my PhD around the same time, we spent a lot of time chatting about it. And um, he was very careful to to not um, make that mistake. Um, just trying to remember the other one. They've kind of come and gone over the years. Their yeah. performance, I think, have done one as well, but I can't remember if they do the conversion or not. But yes, yeah. it's really important to ask that question. Is this the actual value from the patch that you took or is this the estimated whole body value because they are fundamentally different? Yeah. I'll, and just so everyone knows, I'll ask um, Precision and I'll ask Levelin if um, if they are doing that and get back to everyone on that and so everyone knows. Mm. Yeah, and Precision is potentially a different kettle of fish because the whole way that you get sweat is completely different. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, most athletes have seen this and it's something something that I found really interesting on Alan's podcast. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's called The Long Long Munch. Is that right, Alan? Yep. yep. The Long Munch, it's on Spotify, on uh, Apple and everything. It's very interesting. Uh, they take a perspective of a practitioner and then an, usually an athlete uh, on the same topic. It's, it's really engaging. Um, they try not to get too heavy into the science and keep it uh, very practical. So I, I enjoy it uh, from both aspects and I'm sure a lot of athletes will. We can share that um, with everyone in the post-show notes um, from today. I think something that I found really uh, encouraging was that um, a lot of uh, their guests on there that are experts in hydration do uh, talk about the need or at least the practical advantages of understanding sweat rate. And I think that's nice to hear from our perspective. Um, I think something that was drilled into me again from listening to Alan's show was that a single test is not going to be very useful. And would you agree with that, Alan? Because it, oh, it totally, yeah, yeah, because it means... only gives you that point in time for whatever it was happening at that point in time. And that's as good as nothing, really. It's we talk mm. about multiple data points to try and create a picture to the athlete. Yeah, and, and the Ironman is the perfect example of this. I remember that first Ironman Melbourne that I that I went down there to support some of the athletes I was working with. And I remember, you know, the start for the swim, it was freezing. It was about 12 degrees Celsius, which I can't remember off the top of my head what that is in Fahrenheit, sorry. Um, but it's it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And then by the middle of the day, it was 25 degrees Celsius. And so, you know, it's it's quite warm obviously not as hot as you would get in Kona or somewhere like that, but yeah, there's a big discrepancy. And so the sweat rate, even if you're doing the same exercise, which you're not, obviously you're in the water, but if you, even if you're doing the same exercise, you know, you had people coming out uh, onto the bike and they were literally shivering. They were so cold coming out, but then by the run, they were quite hot. And so obviously your sweat rate when you're shivering is going to be almost zero. And when you're quite hot, it's going to be substantial. So even if you do, a sweat rate test you know you can't then go and do that test and go well it was 700 mils an hour my sweat rate is 700 mils an hour well it was in those conditions at that airflow you know depending on if it was running or riding obviously you got different airflow over you in that that temperature and humidity and that sort of combination of things but those things change over the course of a single event so you know yeah as you said scott you got to build up that sort of profile and go well my range is likely to be maybe 200 mils an hour at the low end and maybe a liter an hour at the upper end and it's going to change over the course of the day depending on what the weather does and depending on what i'm doing yeah and and i think for for all the athletes out there who are either on fuel in or doing this at home <clears throat> and their spreadsheets it, it's really 
what we want to emphasize is it's a range, it's a guardrail. It's never you just lose 700 mils an hour. There is going to be that flexibility. And the only way you're going to find that range is by doing testing, as Alan said, at differing temperatures, at differing intensities, on the bike, on the run, um, working out what your fluid loss rate is, what your, and then documenting what your fluid rate intake is. And then you can start to work out what your sweat rate percentage is and body weight percentage loss is. And then starting to build a picture <clears throat> that allows you to build in an appropriate hydration plan, either by yourself or working with a professional. And I think that's really important. And it, it all comes back to all the information about the sodium in that that fluid loss is going to impact your potentially your sodium loss as well and the need for replacing, depending on how much you're actually going to be able to replace in either the bike or the run. Mm. I thought something that um, Alan also pointed out to me was, and thankfully we do this, is like record like what, were you thirsty at the end of the sessions? Um, did you get GI complaints? Um, you know, be that scientist, be N equals one yourself and decipher what it is you actually require in order to maximize your performance. And that's a really important one, Scott, because if you find that, you know, you finish and you only replace 30% of your fluid losses, if you're measuring how much you drank and how much you lost, mm -hmm. then the question is why? So was I very thirsty? Well, yes. So why didn't I drink more? Because I didn't have yeah. enough fluid available. So my issue is I need to make more fluid available. Or if I was not thirsty at all and I still only drank 30%, well, maybe I need to drink a little bit ahead of thirst. Maybe thirst is not a, a great indicator for me. And so that's a completely different strategy that you've then got to put in place. Um, or the flip side to it might be, yeah, I only drank 20% because I had a lot of gut issues. So actually I don't tolerate drinking more fluid and I need to get better at tolerating it. So I've got to go away and deliberately push that in training to get my gut adapted to being better at being able to consume that volume. So having that extra information about how much you drank, the thirst rating and the gut symptoms gives you just so much more information about, you know, like you don't just get this data, what is my sweat rate? You get data about how much did I drink? And if it's not great, what's going wrong and what can I do about it? Yeah. I love it. It's very, very good. And, and that probably comes into this slide really nicely is, and just, I think some of the testing that we're seeing is they're prescribing a, a set milligram per hour. And what I wanted to highlight with this was the danger of taking in exactly the same amount of sodium per hour, but depending on your fluid intake, that could significantly impact the milligrams per liter. And I think this is something that a lot of athletes aren't always aware of. So if you were consuming, say six, uh, you know, you'd consumed a total of a litre um, in 1.4 hours, that works out at 600 mils an hour, which if you're taking in the same amount of sodium per hour, that works out at about just over 1,100 milligrams per litre. But if that volume of fluid in the next hour dropped, but you continue to take in the same amount of sodium, you can see that the milligrams per litre start to jump now if that may be okay for a two hour event but if you start getting into that you know four five six hours and rate of fluid consumption starts going down but your milligrams per hour stay very consistent or your total sodium intake stays consistent you could then start to run into the problems that um that alan was talking about with an over consumption of sodium and what physiological or physical uh implications that could have on you and I think we, I, I honestly saw this at uh, the world championships where some athletes inadvertently were taking in two and a half thousand milligrams per liter um, of sodium because they weren't aware of the lack of fluid they were taking in and all that consistent push of sodium into their, through all their products they were consuming. So I think it's just something to highlight and something to be aware of. And it really shows that balance, Alan, doesn't it, of like that interrelationship between sweat rate and uh, fluid intake and sodium intake and sodium loss, I guess. Yeah, totally. And I think this comes back to, as I was saying before, that kind of chicken and egg scenario. Like if you want to target a, a certain amount of sodium no matter what and try and use that to drive the thirst to make you drink more, well, then maybe you do go for that milligram per hour. But if you want to use the fluid intake – 
to then say, okay, we're going to drink a certain amount of fluid and based on how much we drink, we want to balance that with sodium. Then you go for that milligrams per liter approach. So I don't think there's kind of a right or wrong one that's emerged. Although, as you said, the danger is if you go with that fixed amount of sodium and you go too high, then you get a massive mismatch and that can be problematic. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right. I'm not going to go through all of this in, in terrible detail, uh, just to say that obviously one of the things that when we talk about sodium, people think, you know, cramping. If you do that kind of word association, they're the first two things that are probably going to come up. And I guess this is just to explain that cramping is a really complex syndrome or phenomenon. And it's not as simplistic as saying this is the thing that causes cramping. And if we just fix that, we won't cramp. And if I had a dollar for everyone who asked me that question, I'd probably be well well and truly retired by now. But on the flip side, I've got that many people who go out there and, you know, they assume that sodium is the issue why they're cramping. So they go out and take a bucket load of sodium and they still cramp. So clearly, you know, sodium might be helpful for some people, but it's not the universal fix for everyone. Now, this model, I'm certainly not taking the credit for this. Um, this is just a, a redrawing that I've done um, based on an original drawing that was done by Professor Kevin Miller, who's now at Texas State University, he used to be at uh, Central Michigan University, he's just moved in the last month or so. Um, and it's sort of bringing together all the, the scientific information we have currently around cramping that happens during exercise. Um, and basically what he's saying is that there's, there's kind of two things that can kind of happen or two main things that can happen that feed into our nervous system that then impacts on the way that our nervous system interacts with the muscles and then makes them cramp in the in the right combination of, of situations. So the first thing on the left-hand side, he says, is that things can change the actual functioning of the central nervous system ahead of when you're actually cramping. And this can be things like we know people with certain um, medical conditions or certain medications tends to increase your risk of cramping. Um, the actual physical stress of the exercise itself one area that he's starting to look at um, is he suspects that actually psychological stress can have an impact as well on people's risk of cramping because it's changing the, the way that the nervous system functions. And then other things like stimulants, which can include caffeine. So for some people, that's maybe not an issue, but for some people, it may be a contributing factor. So none of these things on their own are going to make you cramp, but what they might do is get you closer to that point where you do start to cramp. Now, over on the right-hand side, we've got a whole bunch of things that are going on within the muscle that then send feedback back to our nervous system. So this can be things like the temperature of our muscles, which is to do with both the, the environmental conditions on the day, so it's a hot day, but it's also to do about the exercise intensity because the higher the exercise intensity, the more energy we're producing, which produces more heat within the muscle as well. We've also got pain in there, and certainly so some people anecdotally will say that their cramping gets a lot worse uh, if they've done an injury or they've just come off their bike or something like that. Uh, muscle fatigue, uh, which can be due to a whole range of things, and that could be a hydration component. It could be a carbohydrate component to that as well. Uh, and then having muscles that contract in a shortened position. So again, that's more around the biomechanical side of things in terms of bike fits, in terms of shoes for running and, and those kind of things as well. So we know all of this stuff kind of goes on and not any one of these things will make you cramp. But when a certain combination of these things adds up to a certain point, you, your nervous system kind of tips over and then then the cramping seems to happen. Uh, now, you mentioned the long munch before, Scott. We actually published a podcast literally yesterday with Kevin where he goes through and explains this. So if you're interested in it, um, that's probably one that's well worth having a listen to. And he sort of explains it, how he came up with this model and, and all the different sort of parts associated with it. But you can just see at the very top there, we've kind of got all the different risk factors that, that he's identified so far that kind of feed into this. So things like health conditions and medications, as I said before, Clear, clearly there's a genetic component some people are just far more prone to cramping than others um, the anxiety is an interesting one um, exercise intensity so going harder than what you do in training or longer duration longer than you do in training which is why people tend to cramp more on race day compared to in training and the anxiety component is another one that might be fundamentally different on race day compared to in training as well obviously conditions hot weather we tend to cramp more Lack of sleep is another interesting one that he's starting to, to do some research on. So if you have poor night's sleep, are you more prone to cramping? And for some people that may be yes. 
a crash or an accident during the race, as I said, um, just inadequate conditioning, so inadequate training for the type of event you're taking on. So the person who goes off and does an Ironman on four weeks of training, that kind of thing, obviously usually doesn't end well. Uh, the biomechanical stuff, so overusing small sort of stabilizing muscle groups because you've got the wrong shoes or your bike fits not right, that kind of thing. Uh, possibly inadequate carbohydrate for the work that you're doing. Again, another consideration. Um, and also, you know, we can't rule out the dehydration side of things in here as well. But I guess th the whole point of this is that there's lots of different things going on. It's probably going to be different in different people. But also that the reason that it's so hard to figure out the cause of cramping is if there's multiple factors going on, you can't do the old scientific approach of let's just change one thing at a time and see if that's the thing because you might eliminate that, but there's three other things that are still contributing. So it makes it really hard to figure out. And so as Kevin says, you've got to kind of take the kitchen sink approach and go, well, let's control as many of those risk factors as we possibly can at the same time to see if we can reduce our cramping risk. But uh, yeah, it's it's complicated. Uh, there's not <laughs> a lot of research in this area, unfortunately, as, as he explains in the podcast, that's probably due to a lack of interest from a funding point of view. Um, and and as I said earlier, like when there's a lack of research and a lack of knowledge in an area, that gap will qu qu quickly get filled by whoever wants to fill it. And that's what we see all the time with all sorts of miracle pills and potions and capsules and sprays and everything else that's around there for cramping, which sometimes they work for people, but a lot of the time they don't. It's it's funny. I mean, I look at the top potential exacerbation factors and this comes back to, you know, anecdotally is this why we see people who take on more sodium and potentially like all the other i guess the other factors in terms of improving performance nutrition you know they start taking in more carbs they're a little bit more aware of their sweat loss so they drink a little bit more they put in extra sodium sodium drives thirst so they drink more on top of that that helps with their sweat rate and lo and behold they stop cramping so yes. is it is it the sodium that's stopping them cramping or is it the sodium that's driving them to drink more and that replaces more of their fluid loss because they're a heavy sweater and because they're consuming more carbohydrates they're fueling their muscles better and maybe because they're consuming more carbs they're also drinking a little bit more and so it just is that multifactorial sort of approach in that they're just doing everything a little bit better that then ultimately stops them from they focus on the cramping but the cramping is just the byproduct of maybe all the things they were doing poorly before yeah yeah quite possibly um it, it's an interesting one and the other the other area has been looked at and, and you know anyone who's sort of followed the story around pickle juice and hot shots and those yeah, kind of yeah. products is uh, i guess that's not so much about cramping prevention but cramping relief when it does start to happen is, you know, there, there are receptors in our, our mouth and our throat that react to, to all sorts of things, including the chili and the, the acidic things that are in the hot shots. And obviously is the acidic things in the, the pickle juice, uh, possibly salt as well. We haven't really studied that very well, um, but then send feedback and then that calms down the central nervous system and actually makes us less likely to cramp at least temporarily. Um, most of those things seem to have some impact, but they're not a magic bullet in that people still cramp but they probably just cramp a little bit less or a little bit less severely is that is that vagal nerve stimulation is that am i correct in thinking that that's what uh, it's working on the pickle juice and that Something it's what they that? call transient receptor potential again it's a transient receptor potential agonist trp agonist um so there's a whole bunch of receptors in the mouth that um react to various things some of the react to vanilla some react to chili some react to sort of gingery garlicky type things um there's a whole bunch of different ones there's about six different classes of them that then feed back to the nervous system okay and that that's what the pickle juice and the chili shots and all that as far as we know sure. yeah okay i remember seeing a presentation on that a long time ago and it mm. was very interesting but as with most of this research it was like more research required <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, so I guess just to, to finish off all of this, I guess, as I said before, we really don't have good research that there's a performance benefit from replacing sodium during exercise. Um, from a hyponatremia point of view, if you're drinking too much water, you're going to end up with hyponatremia regardless, unless you're taking bucket loads of sodium. And then you're actually going to end up with hyponatremia type symptoms anyway, because you're going to get overhydrated, 
whether that sits within or outside your cells. We won't go into that now. Uh, I guess the, the one where I see a potential benefit that may, as I said at the start, translate into a performance benefit in some of those really longer duration events is the ability to hold a better blood volume for the same um, without dropping your blood sodium concentration. So if you are aggressively replacing your fluid during those really long events, by having that sodium to balance the water there, you can maintain a higher blood volume. Or in other words, if you didn't have any sodium during exercise, you would probably end up with that blood volume shrinking and potentially detrimental there. But it's really hard to design and, and do a research study that measures performance after 10 or 15 hours of exercise. So it's kind of one of those theoretical things that will be really hard to prove in a, in a research study. Um, cramping, I think the jury's still out a little bit. There might be some role of sodium in there or, or possibly other electrolytes, but I think what we can be pretty confident in is that's not going to be a magic bullet for everyone. Um, cramping is far too complex an issue and to say that's just due to sodium or just due to magnesium or something is, is far too simplistic for, for human biology. Uh, encouraging fluid intake, yes, we know that having saltier drinks or, or salt in food will make us want to drink more. Uh, I think there's enough evidence for that during exercise now as well as outside of exercise. The fluid absorption it doesn't seem to be a major player. The carbohydrate, if anything, has more effect there. Uh, and then the taste preference side of things. And, and I guess finishing all of this off is like saying, okay, well, where you do see the ticks there, how many of those actually need a sweat test to get that benefit? And the answer would probably only be that blood volume one on the left. And, and that's really in the ultra endurance type exercise. So that's where a sweat test might be useful in terms of sodium testing. But for those other things, it's probably more that season to taste. And just i know we put a cross near performance and to talk about all the the elements of performance that you talked about but if athletes do increase their sodium intake to encourage fluid intake and therefore that results in them not cramping which i know cramping is potentially there or it increases so they don't lose as much body weight loss could I mean, theoretically, that does improve performance, though, doesn't it? Like from that standpoint, I know why the cross is there in terms of performance mm. from that. But from that perspective of performance, if their body weight loss percentage is maintained to a manageable level, they're drinking more in relation to their sweat rate. You, would you say that that is a performance benefit? Well, theoretically, and that's why there's the tick next to the yeah. blood volume there that yeah. then could feed back to performance. But again, um, you know, for that to get to the stage where it is impacting, um, you know, you need to lose. Several hours. Yeah, it needs to be several hours, basically. Like if you go out and run a marathon, yes, dehydration will negatively impact your performance, but your blood sodium concentration is going up. And so yeah. just drinking plain water will stabilize that. You don't need sodium to do that to maintain that blood volume. It's only in that really long stuff where that becomes an issue. Yeah. And I guess one of the questions that I this got me thinking about was a lot of training, you know, based on that model, you know, less than four hours, therefore you don't need to necessarily be thinking about replacing 70% or whatnot and replacing sodium at high levels. But when the athletes are training for an event that is going to be over four hours, but training sessions are smaller than the total duration you're talking about, is there value or do you see value in training that hydration strategy for those longer events, even though it is in shorter duration training session? Yeah, and I think the, the benefit is not necessarily in the training itself. It's more about adapting your gut so yeah. it can tolerate that on race day. So it's not necessarily that you're going to train better because of it, but it's more that you get your gut into a state that you can actually do that on race day and not run into trouble. Yeah, that's that's fantastic to hear, I guess, because that's what we talk about a lot in terms of that. And and the practical side of it, isn't it? Like yeah, you talk yeah, about totally. like it's it's like how do you mat how many bottles have you got on your bike and how do you manage that and how like what products are you going to consume to actually practice that gut training to get you yeah. know be better in a race situation. So yeah. And like some of that taste preference stuff, until you go out and do a six hour ride and try all these different products, you're not going to know whether you're going to dislike that taste six hours into a race or not you, you know you can do that in one hour or just sitting around in your kitchen at home and try and go yeah it tastes good but it could be a very different story on race day certainly we certainly hear that a lot so mm -hmm. 
I have two, um, two questions for Scott, yeah. Jonathan. One on like day to day hydration and sodium needs. So, is there, do you have views on that in terms of, you know, those, the standard, what is like eight cups a day of water? And then all these brands now are saying, oh, you need to take electrolytes just even daily, even if you're not working out. Do you, what, what are your views on that? And then uh, the follow up is around, we had a question about BOA. Blast, I think that's the new product where uh, I think it's aerosol salts or something that you spray into your mouth and their claim is that it helps uh, increase the speed of the absorption of sodium and would be curious if you had any perspectives on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first one, I guess, when we start off with the fluid side of things, you know, do we need to sort of go out of our way to, to drink more? Well, I guess that depends on the, the fluid loss from training. So if you're going out there and doing a six hour ride on the weekend, then probably, yeah, you are going to need to drink more, whether it's during the session afterwards or both. I guess, do you have to go out and be quite scientific or, you know, really quantify that? Uh, maybe during training, you try to do that a little bit, particularly if the quality of that session is important. Uh, probably thirst is going to bring you back to where you need to go outside of training. In most cases, I guess the exception to that would be if you do a big training session, you know, I guess a lot of Ironman athletes might train morning and, and night uh, before and after work and then have to repeat that again the next day. And so in that case, if you lost a big amount of fluid in a, an evening training session and then you've got to do a hard session again the next morning, you might want to deliberately sort of increase your fluid intake. And, and your kidneys are pretty clever at sort of balancing everything out. So as long as you've got enough, your kidneys will get rid of the excess. Um, that said, you don't want to be up all night going to the toilet either. Um, that's not, not great for your quality of sleep, which is obviously going to impact on trading. So it's, it is a bit of a balancing act. Uh, in terms of electrolytes... Alan, just on that, can I ask yeah. a question? If someone did weigh themselves and did like, you know, they calculated they've lost this much percentage of body weight, my understanding is you should aim to replace somewhere between 150 to 200% of that body weight loss if you're trying to rehydrate, certainly if you have a second session that day or the next day. Is that what you would be recommending? Yeah, about 150% of, yeah. Yeah, of the deficit that you ended up okay. with. I mean, you may not end up you know, assuming that you drank something yeah. during that first session. The deficit may not be massive. Um, yeah if you didn't drink much at all then it might be bigger uh yeah so about 150 percent um and that's really i guess if you need to get back to that level of hydration within sort of 12 hours or so exactly. yeah. um or if you know it could be a bit longer but eight hours eight hours of that you're asleep obviously it's limited yeah. opportunities so yeah yeah but i think if you've got more than 12 waking hours until the next session then probably thirst um and your kidneys are going to get you to where you need to go cool thank you sorry uh, and then in terms of electrolytes, this is sort of the stuff I looked at in my PhD around, you know, changing the amount of sodium in your diet and how that affects your sweat and urine losses of sodium uh, or, or other electrolytes. And it, it's quite dramatic. Um, we've just finished up a study now where we got people running for five hours uh, in the heat on a treadmill. Terrible study. Don't recommend it. Um, but what we see is in, in one group, we gave them 100% sodium replacement in capsules. And the other group, we gave them placebo capsules. So they literally got no sodium at all. Uh, and then we look at how much sodium they pee out in the next 24 hours afterwards. And I had to check the machine wasn't broken because the amount of sodium in their urine when they were on the placebo capsules was so low. Like the the kidneys just conserved that sodium so well. Um, it, it wasn't able to conserve all of it because you know five hours obviously you've lost a lot um but it did a pretty good job and and you see that in sweat concentrations it takes a little bit longer probably a day or two but yeah day to day you're not going to accumulate a sodium deficit because your kidneys and your sweat glands are just to changes in the amount of sodium in your diet they're too clever for that um they can reduce your sweat sodium down to virtually nothing and the same in your urine so yeah i mean it's it's more i guess about that one-off exercise bout because from day to day your body's going to figure that out for you. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Oh, and sorry, the other one was the the spray electrolytes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't come across that myself. Um, I guess the question is why? <laughs> why do you need to get electrolytes into the body that quickly, um, particularly in the absence of water? So, yeah, uh, like a maybe it does absorb it quicker maybe it doesn't but i guess the question is why would you need to absorb it that quickly apart from maybe if someone's got hypernatremia and you're trying to treat them but usually you're in a medical tent and they're giving you an iv if that's that dire yeah 
And what about like the salt licks? Have you seen those? Like base performance does this salt lick. Do you think yeah. that's more about just driving thirst as much as anything? Like, because it's salty, it's quite nice. Well, it, it could therefore... well be, yeah. So some of it could be about that flavor fatigue side of it. Some of it could be about driving thirst. I mean, basically, it's just a way of getting sodium in without water. Yeah. Which um, in some situations, if you've overdone the plain water, might be beneficial. Like, I don't know. Like, like often when I talk about this stuff, some people go, oh, so you don't need sodium capsules or tablets. And I say, well, no, potentially you could use sodium capsules or tablets to get the sodium because it gives you a nice quantified amount. It's easy to take uh, rather than try to juggle it in fluid and, and foods and things like that. But it's about taking the right amount of those things and not overdoing it. And you don't need nearly as much as people tend to do and, and go overboard with it. So whether it comes from fluid or capsules, tablets, doesn't really matter. It's about the quantity, regardless of how it gets in there. Which I think is a really nice way of sort of rounding it out, isn't it? It's like, mm. like be objective about this, but don't be like crazy. I, I think the the real value in what I've heard today is, you know, be aware of some of the pitfalls in what is being presented and then be systematic about the way in which you are taking in these products and be aware of maybe the need or lack of need of some of them as well for the people who necessarily aren't high sweaters, don't replace a lot of fluid and aren't exercising for a long time. There may not be this need from what I'm hearing for yep. high sodium intake. Sodium certainly can be useful, but maybe not at the huge quantities that maybe is getting pushed on a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think you alluded to it before, Scott. The other thing to bear in mind is we, we tend to think about the sodium that's in our fluids and then any capsules or tablets, but we've got to remember that there's often sodium in the foods that we're consuming as well, whether it's gels that have sodium in them or whether it's bars or things that you've made yourself, homemade type goodies, um, often they can be high in sodium as well. So we can't forget about that. But yeah. I guess the other thing is, like, if we overdo the sodium slightly, it's probably going to be harmless. It's not really going to do anything. It's only if we really overshoot the sodium, we're going to be just terribly thirsty and feel pretty awful. Did you see high, therefore, high sodium excretion in the urine in the people who were taking the, the capsules with the, the salt capsules in that study that's yet to be released? Is that what uh, you saw, a higher amount of sodium in the urine? Well, certainly a lot higher than the other condition, yeah. but it was normal, basically. So it didn't. So where did the sodium go? Well, out in their sweat during the five hours so, of exercise. So then their sweat concentration was higher. Is that what you found? No, the well? same, the same, or very similar. Yeah, we, we see that the sweat glands adjust to salt intake much more slowly than our kidneys. Our kidneys can adapt within an hour or two. Sweat glands seem to take at least twelve hours, possibly up to twenty-four hours, to start to change uh, in terms okay. of the sodium output. We don't really know why, but that's certainly what's been observed. Um, so the extra sodium taken in would eventually be released over the next sort of 24 to 48 hours, but it would be stored somewhere in that um, extra well, sodium. Well, it? no, because the sodium was designed to replace but not exceed what was being lost. Ah, okay. So, so essentially what you see in the enough. urine after exercise, it just continues on as if there wasn't any exercise in the first place. So it okay. looks like what, because they collected their urine the three days before exercise and didn't do any exercise as well. So what you see in the urine is that the sodium loss just continues on as if there was no exercise, whereas in the group where they didn't have any sodium and they exercised, you go into a massive conservation to try and hmm. make up that gap. And is there plans on doing maybe a study where you take in excessive sodium and seeing what that does? Not really, because no one would ever recommend that. So... There's no well, point to really study. There, there's is, pretty, there is a there's couple some of cases. pretty high recommendations. At yeah. the I'm saying um, I'd be fascinated to know what they did. Yeah, but I don't think anyone out there is recommending taking more than 100%. Some people are just saying 100% and that's a lot, depending on what their sodium guess, loss is. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. when I'm seeing 2,800 milligrams per hour as yeah. a recommendation for an athlete. And I'm sort of like, wow, that is a lot of sodium to be taking in. And yes. Is, yeah. is the recommended amount there too high and what are the are there physical or physiological implications of taking in that amount is it well, dangerous, the, or is the, it well dangerous? The, theoretically not if you're actually genuinely losing that amount you yeah. still only you know 100 replacement is 100 replacement whether it's 100 of 300 milligrams an hour or 100 of 3000 milligrams an hour yeah. um you're still kind of offsetting the loss i guess it's just that that 100 replacement doesn't seem to be necessary
and, and, and there is a couple of case studies being published from yeah, there's a couple of case studies published uh, i think both of them might be actually from the western states ultra marathon where people just took an arbitrary ridiculous amount of salt capsules or tablets and ended up in hospital as a result um the case studies themselves aren't that great because they've got to try and like sort of forensically work backwards and put all the pieces together so. and and how reliable some of that data is is, is a bit unknown um th their claim there is that they had so many salt capsules that they then got so thirsty that they drank so much that they ended up with hyponatremia hmm. um now i would say they probably didn't have hyponatremia but they did have fluid overload because the fluid overload is actually the dangerous part not the hyponatremia itself um, yeah. it's just that hyponatremia is caused by fluid overload that then moves into your cells but even if you replace all the sodium and drink massive amounts of water you're still going to expand your cells and get the same problem yeah okay yeah I, I guess that's always the problem with those retrospective studies isn't it and anecdotal yeah. so how much did you take in it's like oh i can't remember as yes. well if they ended up in hospital they probably don't have a clear recollection yeah. of what happened and that's a hard thing we don't really have lots of good data about how much people actually drink in real race situations as a percentage of their losses because to do that you've got to accurately measure their losses and accurately measure what they drink and to do that in a real competitive environment is almost impossible it's pretty much impossible there's, isn't it? yeah there's there's only a few situations like 24-hour mountain biking where they do laps around the same course and always come back and pick up fluid where you could genuinely weigh it every time so there's a few examples where you can do yeah. it but something like triathlon it's virtually impossible uh, it's tough it's tough um which is and also just as a segue what's i think it's this sunday we're releasing a new release into the filling app which will in when the athletes are recording their total fluid intake they're now able to select the products which contain sodium mm -hmm. in it so i think what's going to be really nice is athletes can then start to quantify total amounts of sodium consumed as well and start mm. to see based on their fluid intake how many milligrams per liter they're taking in which i think is going to be really useful because i think as to what you were saying a lot of athletes don't uh, take into consideration that bars gels blocks have sodium yeah. in them as well and then they're taking mm. in these salt capsules and electrolytes and as you know some of these electrolytes do have a lot of sodium in them and i think it will be really interesting then looking at the data and seeing you know do we have of the 200 odd athletes on the program how much average sodium is being taken in by athletes and breaking that down into maybe gender and breaking it down into body size um, we, mm. we could dive into some of that data and you know and see what it looks like and share that yeah, yeah i think it will be really interesting to see what people are doing definitely yeah um i know we've taken a lot of your time sorry about that um does That's anyone right. have any more questions i know i've sort of just been asking a lot because i'm super interested in this um does anyone have any other questions for alan whilst we've got him um I hope everyone found it as fascinating as I did. Um, I would love to chime in quick. Gender differences, yeah. male, female, do you, is there a component or a factor there that's important at all? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, there's bits that we know some data on, some bits we don't know well. In terms of actual sweat sodium concentration for females, uh, does it change across the menstrual cycle, for example? There is some research going back to the 50s and 60s, but they didn't really characterize the phases of the menstrual cycle very well or very accurately. They certainly didn't measure you know, estradiol or progesterone or anything. So from that perspective, they suggested that there was actually no difference. Um, but how reliable that data is, is hard to say. And I don't think there has been any sort of newer data in that space. So unfortunately, it's something we don't know a lot about. Uh, Generally speaking, sweat sodium concentration to a large extent is a function of diet, but also a function of sweat rate itself. So any individual, the higher your sweat rate, generally your sweat sodium concentration goes up because as the sweat goes up through the duct and tries to reabsorb that sodium back through, the faster you force the sweat through, the less of this, less percentage of the sodium gets reabsorbed. Um, so generally what we tend to see is the bigger the person, male or female, the higher the sweat rate, just because you're moving a bigger body, it's going to take more energy. Uh, and the higher that is, the higher the sweat sodium concentration. And so you do tend to see a bit of a difference between males and females, males tending to have a higher 
sweat sodium concentration and obviously total loss because the sweat rate is high. Uh, but whether that's a gender or sex difference or it's just a body size difference is, is hard to tease out, but it seems like probably more a body size difference. I guess the difference that we do know is probably more sex specific is around total body water and fluid retention at different phases of the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and the effect that that has on hydration. But yeah, I think it's still far too early days to make any sort of conclusive statements about that, either in terms of male-female differences or across phases of the menstrual cycle. Great. Thank you. Alan, wasn't there, there something, I remember listening on your podcast, there was something about it, submax efforts, it's all very similar in terms of sweat production, but then at higher rates, it's not that yes. women have less glands, it's just their sweat glands aren't as effective at producing sweat at max effort. Is that correct? Oh, is you're what, right, actually. Yeah, yeah. So that's really at the very upper end. Upper so, end. So generally our sweat rate is determined by the amount of heat that we're producing because we're not going to like overproduce sweat because it's going to cool us down too much or it's just unnecessary. It's just losing water for the sake of it. So our body tends to produce the amount of sweat that it needs to, to evaporate the amount that it needs to, to get our body temperature stable to where it needs to. And so obviously the more energy, you know, the more heat you're producing, the more you need to evaporate off the higher sweat rate is going to be. Um, but there's, there's obviously a ceiling to that. You can't just go on and produce 10 litres of sweat an hour. So there is going to be a ceiling uh, and you're right, it might be slightly different in males and females, but for, for most endurance and ultra endurance events, you're going to be below that ceiling anyway. Yeah, for sure. Oh, it's fascinating. Very, very fascinating. Um, Alan, one, uh, one other question. You mentioned sodium concentration can be related to diet. Is there also, did you look at any data of how that, is there a correlation with that in blood pressure as well? Since uh, they say salt can increase blood pressure. Yeah, yeah. The reason that salt increases blood pressure is still really hard to determine. Like, clearly, there's a link there. You can see that it's been brought out from 50 years of research or more. Um, but the exact mechanisms by which that happens is still up for debate. I mean, until 20 years ago, we didn't really understand that we actually store excess sodium in our skin, but in a form that doesn't interact with water. And we can then uh, use that as a buffer to take up excess sodium if we have a high salt diet, but also release that back. And some of the speculation for athletes has been around, well, when do we release that back? And is that relevant to this whole picture that we've just talked about today? And uh, it seems that it's related to blood volume, not to sodium concentration. So there were claims about 10 or 15 years ago, oh, you don't need to worry about taking salt to stop hyponatremia because you'll just release this sodium and it'll all be fine. But in fact, you don't release the sodium when you've got a high blood volume because that's only going to make the blood volume even higher um, mm. by retaining more water which is the opposite of what you want and so it seems to be volume dependent not sodium dependent but yeah in terms of blood pressure no it doesn't seem to be a correlation um, other than possibly like if you're sweating more then that might actually get rid of some of that because you bring your blood volume down you're going to release some of that sodium and so hypertension or high blood pressure for a lot of people seems to be related to storing too much sodium in those um in those skin sites so if you can get rid of the excess that can be helpful and it may be one of the reasons why exercise is beneficial for blood pressure yeah i was going to say that that's interesting when you think of that isn't it like why mm. exercise might reduce blood pressure because maybe it just gets rid of the sodium mm. yeah. fascinating uh very good alan thank you so much for your time yeah. um yeah Thoroughly enjoyed it, um, eye-opening as always, and uh, you're a wealth of knowledge. So thank you very much. I'm sure everyone will appreciate it. And um, we'll share this uh, recording with you so you can share it with your um, you know, athletes and whatnot in your uh, audience, and we will share it with our uh, team as well. Yeah, no worries. Pleasure. Thank you really so much. Thanks, Thanks, Alan. Ooh. Thanks, mate. I know it went a little bit over. <laughs> oh, that's